Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Cassandra Ma, and I'm the Director of Knowledge Management and Professional Development at Philly and Wakely Thorpe Angeletti LLP. I will also be your moderator for this afternoon's webinar. A big thank you to the team at LexisNexis Canada for organizing this program. A few housekeeping items before we jump in. This program is accredited for one hour of continuing professional development, which can be claimed in accordance with the reporting requirements of your respective law society. Questions may be submitted at any time during the program using the Q&A feature in your Zoom window. We will be answering these questions during the scheduled Q&A time slot at the end of the program. Over the last two years, we've seen the world of work evolve in tandem with the waves of the COVID-19 pandemic. And although the pandemic is now declining in severity and Canada is slowly returning to normal, many challenges lie ahead for employers and employees who are looking to transition back to their pre-pandemic workplaces. Luckily, our three expert panelists are here today to help you understand and navigate through the challenges ahead. I'd like to introduce them to you now. Sarah Crossley is a partner at Philly and Wakely, Thorpe Angeletti LLP. In her practice, Sarah provides pragmatic advice to employers on all aspects of labor and employment law. She regularly acts as counsel in wrongful dismissal litigation, human rights proceedings, and grievance arbitrations, and is also regularly retained to conduct workplace investigations. Sarah's clients span some of the industries most drastically changed by the pandemic, including manufacturing, telecommunications, pharmaceutical, and retail. And I'm sure we will all benefit from Sarah's expertise and experience in today's discussion. Giovanna DeSaro is an associate with DLA Piper in Toronto. She offers strategic advice to private and public sector employers on topics such as grievance arbitration, employment contracts and policies, discrimination claims, and accommodation. Giovanna has a comprehensive practice that covers all areas of employment and labor law, including international and constitutional matters. Especially given all of the human rights issues that have been raised by the pandemic, I am very excited to have Giovanna lend her expertise and perspective to our panel. Last but not least, Chris Fulon is a founding partner and the managing partner of Israel Fulon Wong LLP. He represents both employers and employees in a wide range of employment and labor matters, including wrongful dismissals, injunctions, employment standards hearings, workplace safety matters, and human rights proceedings. In his practice, Chris uses a proactive approach to handling workplace issues and focuses on assisting employers in implementing policies and practices that reduce workplace conflict. Chris's insights in this regard will certainly be of value to our webinar attendees today. I welcome all of you and thanks for joining us. So let's just jump right in. The Ontario government last week revoked the proof of vaccination requirement or vaccine passport requirement. Um, effective March 1st, 2022, similar rollbacks have taken place or will be taking place in a number of other Canadian regions, including Alberta, Manitoba, Quebec, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick. In light of these developments, Sarah, should employers still implement or maintain COVID-19 vaccination policies for their own workplaces? I'm going to be very unpopular in my response as it depends. But before I explain why I'm going to say it depends and, and employers organizations could, should think about that. Um, if anyone's been watching the news over the last 24, 36 hours, there have been even additional announcements from the Ontario government. So now in addition to the vaccine passports, you know, being removed as of March 1st, on now on March 14th, mandatory vaccination policies will end. Then on March 21st, most, most masking requirements will end. Um, and Toronto also announced a similar bylaw moving up that requirement. Now, there are some exceptions in terms of public transit, long-term care, healthcare settings, congregate settings, shelters, and jails. Then on March 28th, the reopening of Ontario Act will expire. And then April 27th, it's looking like all remaining measures, directives and orders will end. And so in short, it'll be the removal of the masking requirements and all other regular settings. So suffice to say, there's been a drastic change of events or the legal landscape, at least in Ontario uh, in the last week. So circling back, should employers still implement or maintain their own COVID vaccination policies? As I said, it really depends. Um, in my view, the legal answer is they can um, still implement or maintain the vaccination policies as long as you're subject to human rights considerations, which Giovanna will be talking about later on. The question is really not so much as whether they can they, but do they want to? 
right? It's really going to depend on your organization and the nature of the business or operations that you're uh, involved in. So for example, some reasons why or uh, employers and some clients of mine are deciding to keep um, their policies, at least for the shorter term, even as these changes unfold, because we're just not sure if there's going to be an additional spike. Um, they want to promote a safe work environment. They want to also decrease the reluctance of having employees come back to the workplace as we move towards trying to reintegrate people, because if they continue to have the vaccination policy in place, then there's some comfort level, either real, real or perceived, that there will be less chance of spreading it within the workplace. Um, also, it, depending on the nature of the organization, if you're working with a vulnerable population, whether it's the elderly or immunocompromised or healthcare settings or you know shelters where there's congregate care, um, you may want to continue them for a longer period, notwithstanding the mandatory directives being lifted. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the pros, but what are some of the risks and leaving aside the human rights piece that you mentioned, Giovanna will be covering, but what are some of the risks that employers might face if they choose to go ahead with implementing or keeping a COVID-19 vaccination policy that they have, uh, even though the government locally has changed its stance on vaccination requirements? So I think the answer is a little different depending on whether they're going to implement it or whether they're keeping it and whether it's um, uh, for existing employees or new employees. So if they've already had the policy in place, then, well, first of all, whether you implement it or they have it in place now, um, they may, uh, individuals, organizations may have already raised concerns about constructive dismissal because, you know, none of us had the foresight to see um, this happened, although a couple of uh, authors apparently wrote books about it and, and <laughs> were published prior to this happening. Uh, but any event, in terms of that, it would have been seen or could have been seen as a fundamental change to the terms and conditions of employment, or at least a number of employees who did not want to become vaccinated have alleged that. There's a number of cases still going through the court system, and I think it's very fact dependent, and particularly depending on the nature and the situations in which they arose. In terms of new hires, I think there is less of a risk, um, again, subject to human rights uh, considerations. Um, but what I think, if you maintain the existing policies, I think of number of organizations, uh, because of the um, different outcomes in a number of cases, there are a number of people both in the unionized workforce and in the uh, non-unionized workforce where they have been put on an unpaid leave pending you know some later period of time when either there's some clarity or these sorts of um, mandates or directives are lifted and so I think now is where the rubber's going to hit the road and there are going to have to be some real decisions as to do these people come back uh, are there are the other employees in the workplace going to be uncomfortable having people that aren't vaccinated in the workplace privacy concerns um, terminations bumping rights I think you know depending on the organization and how many people have been out on leave um, there's a, there could be some real um, conundrums that are going to have to be faced in the coming weeks yeah. now let, let's say we have an employer who recognizes all these risks, but is very courageous and wants to implement a workplace vaccination policy, despite all of the things that Sarah has mentioned, and despite the local government uh, lifting the vaccine passport mandate. Chris, what features should be included in a vaccination policy when an employer is drafting it? And how should an employer decide whether to use a mandatory vaccination approach or to use an optional vaccination policy where um, masking or regular testing uh, could be an alternative to getting vaccinated. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting, and, and I'm not I'm not sure that there's all that much change that's really going to be happening as of March 14th because oftentimes when we talk about like the requirement to have a vaccination policy, we, we kind of forget what did the government mandate, right? The, the government mandated that you have to have a vaccination policy, but depending, other than in very certain narrow circumstances, there was no, uh, there was no, uh, the government wasn't dictating what had to be in that vaccination policy. So we already had all kinds of different variations of vaccination policies that we had in place for various employers that, that ran the gambit from mandatory uh, vaccination and you must show proof of vaccination of first dose, second dose and booster uh, to a situation of vaccine or testing 
or to situations where it was simply uh, recommended that you get vaccinated. So I think really um, the dates are all new. Was it, was it March 14th, Sarah, where that new, that, that requirement is dropping? Yeah, so, so what's dropping is the obligation to have a policy in place. But I think we're still gonna be asking all the same questions and it, and it goes back to what Sarah was saying, saying at the start of this is it depends. Uh, we're still gonna be dealing with all those same questions as uh, what is the nature of the workplace and what makes sense in that particular workplace. So situations in workplaces where we're dealing with uh, interaction with vulnerable individuals, uh, situations where you're working with people in uh, close quarters, uh, I would still be advocating for many of my employer clients to be saying we should still have uh, policies in place that are requiring uh, either vaccination or requiring testing or both, at least in the short term, um, because we do still have obligations that exist outside of these government mandates, for example, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And I do think in, in lots of circumstances, you do have potential liability uh, if you are exposing people or exposing vulnerable people to potential, um, potential uh, infection. Uh, so for all those reasons, I, I would still be saying, look at your particular circumstances, look at your particular workplace and determine uh, what type of policy you want to have in place, what level of restrictions, what protections. And, and the other point that Sarah made, which I think is a great one, uh, is you also want to look at it as we're all going to be working and helping our employer clients to try to get people back to work. So if we can use this policy as a, uh, as a basis to say, hey, you should come back to work because this workplace is safe, I think that's a great tool to be able to have as well. So those are the, those are the factors that I think you want to be taking into account. Uh, and then from there, you decide what do you want to include and what do you not want to include in your in your vaccine policy moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you you've set up a nice segue to our next question, where if we're talking about um, feeling as though the workplace is safe, feeling as though it's appropriate for employees to return, um, you know, the there could be situations where an employee is unwilling or unable to return to work, even though the employer has begun requiring a return to work. Giovanna, in situations like that, where an employee might be unwilling or unable to return to work, uh, what should an employer do? And I recognize that there are different scenarios where this could crop up, such as in the case of immunocompromised employees or employees who might have high risk family members or employees who might merely just believe that the workplace is unsafe and are unwilling to come back for that reason. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to say that I agree with all the comments that have been made so far and really wanted to stress that while the current public discourse is focusing on the lifting of restrictions, COVID-19 is still with us. And another thing that is still with us, um, as Chris was mentioning, is the requirement of employers to take every reasonable precaution in the circumstances to protect the health and safety of a worker. That's a general health and safety duty under the OSHA. That is not going anywhere. And in fact, all of the restrictions that we had in place were still subject to the general duty. And if anything, the workplace now with COVID-19 is going to be a little bit more risky to be in for those folks you were talking about before, folks who may have a particular disability, uh, for example, if they're immunocompromised or so on. So there is always going to be some sort of a balancing exercise involved, um, but ultimately the employer needs to make sure the workplace is safe for all the workers in the workplace. There will be situations where employees may feel resistant to return to the workplace because they have a subjective stance or feeling that the workplace is unsafe. And there may be situations where um, truly there might be some concerns, but in most scenarios, usually there will be some subjective feelings or perceptions that influence that decision. And in that case, my recommendation would be to do what you usually do in situations where an employee has concerns that may potentially relate to around discrimination, whether it's disability or for example, even family status because folks have rearranged their lives during these past two years. And if that happens, usually what you would like to do as an employer is make proactive inquiries of the employee to find out what their restrictions and limitations are, whether they be based on their own uh, disability 
the condition or disability of a family member or any kind of other concern that relates to a ground of discrimination. And while I know that employers like to have templates for these kinds of things, uh, ultimately the law requires these, uh, these uh, issues to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. So from a practical perspective, my suggestion is work with counsel to come up with a, with a strategy that you can standardize to some extent, but make sure that you always approach every great case uh, on its own merits and get some assistance if you need to deal with something that is a little bit more complex. For example, a situation where somebody is concerned about a family member's illness. Uh, that might require a little bit more work in terms of getting information from the family member's doctor as well as from the employee. Thanks, Giovanna. And I, I wanna sort of develop this theme of return to onsite work a bit further. Uh, you know, as employees are returning to the workplace, employers will have to start or perhaps resume assessing their occupational health and safety obligations in the context of their physical premises where employees might not have been for the last couple of years. Part and parcel with this will come some of the things that Giovanna was just talking about, implementing protocols and other processes to ensure the safety of workers and to ensure that any uh, worries about the safety of the workplace are uh, calm down or, or, or reassured. So how should an employer handle situations where employees are non-compliant with workplace safety protocols that are established? Chris, perhaps I'll turn this one to you. Yeah, um, I, think, I think we've got a lot of experience uh, with that and, and how, how we would deal with those situations um, just in terms of, and, and I think we, we're gonna keep coming back to it because it, it becomes, uh, simply part of your, your typical Occupational Health and Safety Act compliance, right? So like if I, just to, to put it into an example, if I've got, uh, if I'm running a construction site and I've got somebody who's, who's not wearing their hard hat that day, uh, I'm going to ask them a question. Why are you not complying with our, with our health and safety protocols? Uh, and they're going to give me an answer to that question. Uh, they're going to give me an answer uh, that, that either, um, has some merit to it or that doesn't. And they're gonna give me an answer that either uh, indicates that they are uh, not compiling, compi um, they're not in compliance due to inadvertence or they're deliberately not complying. So there's gonna be a difference between somebody who says, uh, I for I've just forgotten, let me go grab it from my locker and we'll deal with that one way versus somebody who says, I'm not wearing that hard hat and I'm never gonna wear that hard hat. And we're going to have the same type of things coming in place in respect of people wearing masks in the workplace. Uh, and we're going to have to follow different avenues of enforcement, depending on those sorts of things. Um, and then the additional layer of that will be uh, situations where we potentially have a uh, proper basis to be seeking an exemption from the health and safety measure that you have in place. I can't wear a mask due to a particular uh, medical condition that I have, and then we're going to have to engage in the kind of um, human rights analysis that Giovanna was talking about. But I think I think we as uh, employment lawyers and we as HR professionals have really good background and experience and templates as what do we do with people who are non-compliant, and I think we just put this back into that same uh, metric is the way I would approach it. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that a different approach will be necessary in response to employees who flout the rules versus those who are non-compliant due to inadvertence. But when would the employer have just cause to dismiss an employee for breaching workplace safety protocols? Where does that threshold lie on the spectrum? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's health and safety breaches are funny, right? Because you've got lots of situations and lots of, lots of case law where if somebody engages in a very significant health and safety breach, uh, you're into a very serious level of, of misconduct typically, right? Um, so if you've got somebody who's repeatedly, for example, forgetting to wear their mask and you tell them to wear their mask and they go and they put it on, uh, you're going to be following typical health and safety um, or health and safety and progressive discipline principles of first warning, second warning, third warning. Um, you'll, that same scenario will be very different if the person says to you, I'm not going to wear my mask because I don't believe in masks in the workplace. Uh, in that circumstance, you're probably giving one final warning 
and the next time it happens, you're terminating for just cause immediately. Uh, and if they don't have a human rights basis to, to not be wearing that mask, I think you'd be justified. So um, I think it comes down to a situation of very lengthy process to probably get to a termination for, for just cause due to inadvertent breaches of the rules and apologies and corrections and a very quickly, uh, very quickly getting to just cause for deliberate breaching of the rules and, and insubordination in respect of flouting your workplace policies. Now, of course, there's also employees during this time period who are being uh, dismissed without cause or without cause being alleged. In those circumstances, would the COVID-19 pandemic extend the period of common law reasonable notice to which these employees are entitled? I, I know that we've been seeing some cases come out on this. Yeah, I think um, I think the weight of the case law on that seems to be saying, um, and, and there are some outliers, but the weight of the case law I think seems to be saying is a, is a judge on, and I think they've mostly been summary judgment motions, are saying that they want to see some evidence. They want to see some evidence of the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has made it more difficult for a particular employee to find other employment. Um, there have been some judges who've been prepared to take judicial notice of that in particular circumstances, but at the end of the day, COVID-19 has impacted different people and in different industries differently. Uh, if you're an employment lawyer or an HR provider, you had a lot of work to do in COVID-19 and you were in high demand. Uh, medical professionals were in tremendously high demand. Uh, other people who, uh, IT people were in very high demand. Uh, other industries were very, were hit very hard by COVID-19. If you were in hospitality, for example, it, it was devastated. So um, you might in those circumstances get a court being prepared to take judicial notice of the availability or lack of availability in those sections or in those particular sectors. Uh, but I think overall, the court wants to hear at least some evidence of the fact that COVID-19 made it more difficult to mitigate, made it more difficult to find other employment. And in those circumstances, we have seen some COVID bumps, but not huge COVID bumps. Uh, the stuff we've been seeing is, is maybe an extension of a notice period by a month or two months as a result of COVID-19 difficulties, but, but nothing uh, earth shattering from what I've seen. So, Sarah, I want to bring us back to a point that you raised earlier in respect of constructive dismissal risks that come up when an employer might unilaterally implement a policy. And I think you brought this up in the context of vaccination policies, but of course, the same risk applies to any type of policy or practice that uh, an employer wants to unilaterally implement. How can employers guard against this risk going forward as we're seeing uh, the workplace continue to change as the pandemic keeps going on and will likely continue this evolutionary process. So again, for, I think there's, um, there's a distinction to be made between existing employees and new employees. I think as long as you're, you know, um, not in breach of any human rights obligations that you can require vaccination um, for, uh, new hires but for existing employees right let's i think of go back to the basics fundamental and unilateral terms and conditions so unilateral if you 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 know make it so and impose it upon someone without their consent then you know there's that aspect um, but through the course of uh, this pandemic i've had a number of of clients and their employees be quite grateful in terms of the positions that employers have been taking in terms of even if they're not necessarily mandating vaccination but encouraging it and providing alternatives so one way to come out from um, uh, a constructive dismissal claim is have someone agree <laughs> i agree I agree with this policy. I'm going to get vaccinated. Here is here's proof of my vaccination. Uh, the other thing I think is it's really important to provide uh, alternatives, right? Because again, going back to what Chris said, in terms of COVID-19 and vaccination policies, it doesn't you know doesn't mean thou shalt go get jab in arm um, unless it's been directed because of certain. Um, 
uh, healthcare or long-term care settings or, or anything like that. And it's, again, it's always subject to human rights. But if you provide flexibility in terms of increased PPE or rapid antigen testing or PCR, or even if it's um, changing the workplace, providing more flexibility, allowing people to keep different hours so there's not as many people. I think there's many ways to provide alternatives that can assist an employer argue that it's no longer fundamental, it's no longer a fundamental change because of the alternatives provided. Um, so I don't think, you know, just by having a vaccination policy or just by having a COVID-19 uh, policy or necessarily, you know, up the creek sort of thing, thinking that, oh my God, I'm going to have a ton of these constructive dismissal claims. I think, you know, as Giovanna had mentioned earlier, right, there are strategies that can be implemented. And just as um, this pandemic continues and the virus mutates or lessens or hosp right? What was once a more draconian COVID-19 vaccination policy may be lessened. It doesn't mean it goes away, as Giovanna said, because we still have our obligations under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. But, you know, maybe we're morphing into the time that, you know, thou shalt get vaccinated or, you know, wear, you know, full PPE by such and such a date to, right, you know, as we continue, as this pandemic continues to evolve and as this virus and the hospitalizations decrease, we're moving towards a more flexible work environment to that end. We're going to be lessening this, that, and the other, um, but we're still encouraging people to the extent uh, to get vaccinated because, and again, I'm no scientist, so I'm going to self-declare, uh, right? But there seems to be some evidence that by virtue of the number or the, or the higher rate of vaccination status has assisted in herd immunity and help lessen the impact of this pandemic, not just you know locally, but globally. And just Cass, before I um, leave, there was one question in the, in the question box that says, why have a policy for vaccination when it doesn't stop the transmission? People vaccinated and non-vaccinated can spread the virus. That's true. I, that's my understanding of the science as well. Um, but the flip side is, is that a number of organizations or, or industries um, took, took certain steps to encourage vaccination. And it appears that a larger, the um, greater the number of people that received the vaccinations and the boosters seem to help minimize the risk or lessen the impact. And again, I know, um, scientist in terms of, of how diseases, I, can't, I forget the name of the, uh, the particular scientist <laughs> name in terms of diseases, but um, in terms of in order for uh, a virus or variant to keep mutating, it needs to find hosts that it can grow and mutate on. And so the more people, my understanding of the science is who have been vaccinated, it's helped lessen and, and reduce the virus. Thank you, Sarah. Um, you mentioned in your response a point about increasing flexibility and how employers need to keep having a flexible approach as we're going forward. And so I'm curious what all of your perspectives are on whether employers are obligated to continue remote work as one of these kind of flexible work options. Um, while employees are being transitioned back on site. Uh, of course, a number of employees have been working from home for the last few years. Uh, so maybe I'll start off with Chris. Are employers obligated to continue remote work? Should they do it as a best practice if they don't uh, have to continue it? What are your thoughts? Um, the short answer, I think, in terms of do employers have to continue it, I think the answer is no in terms of that. I think that's the short answer. Um, I think that in order for that to be a uh, have to, uh, there'd have to be something either particular about the employee in terms of their particular requirements or something particular about the workplace that makes a return to the office unsafe. So I, I, I don't think that's the case. I don't think there's many situations where uh, an employer is in a have to situation. Um, practically, I think in many, many workplaces, uh, we are in a position where if you're not uh, at least considering a hybrid option for people, uh, you may not have a business anymore. Um, there was a survey that I heard about today, I think that was published by Amazon that said, um, I think 40% of employees in their survey said that if their employer mandated a full return to work, uh, they would quit their job. I think the same survey said only about 12% of employees were prepared 
uh, to say that uh, they would like to return to the office full time. So I think we're going to see uh, labor just taking control of, of their, their power and saying, I'm going to vote with my feet if you're mandating me to return to the workplace full time. Uh, so I think practically uh, employers are going to be in a position to have to be flexible and have uh, hybrid policies for the most part, depending on the workplace, of course. Uh, but uh, do, is it a must? Do I have to do that? I think in almost all circumstances, the answer is going to be no to that question. Sarah, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I was just, um, in terms of, I am seeing, um, as some of my clients are, are saying, come back to the workplace, even on a rotation basis or flexible hours, I, I have seen some uh, employees digging their heels and saying, look, I've now been off for two years. This has now become an implied term and condition of my employment. Um, and so thankfully, uh, when for a number of my clients, you know, we didn't know how long this would happen. So any of the communications that went out, we took every opportunity to advise, to remind people, this is an extraordinary um, change in circumstances. This is only temporary, so that if and when things could return. So um, hopefully, and most people have put it either in their policies or, or some way, but just uh, if you're faced with that uh, challenge, I would look for wherever you've communicated to people either verbally or in a town hall or an email or memorandum or policy that these measures were taken as a result of extraordinary circumstances and you were informed that they were temporary in nature. But as, as Chris has mentioned, um, and particularly depending on the industry that you're in, there is a war out there for talent. And so... Um, in terms of employers, I think gone are the days where, you know, we can say, you know, you must be in all the time, um, because I think the, the talent pool is going to dictate in large part uh, in order to get the top talent. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe this next question also deals with these uh, kind of competing business practices or, or business practices to try to remain competitive. But um, let's say an employer allows for remote work to continue. Some employees return on site, some stay at home. And of course, the ones who are staying at home are not using up the same amount of resources uh, that the employer is providing to the employees on site. So in that circumstance, to what extent does the employer or should the employer cover the employment expenses of the ones working at home, of the employees working from home? Chris, perhaps I'll turn it to you. I, I think that's, uh, in most circumstances, that's an employee wanting their cake and eating it too, quite honestly. Um, I mean, an employee who's working at home in most circumstances, um, it, I mean, every circumstance would be different, but I would imagine if an employer says to their workforce, we're giving you an option that you can choose to work two days at home, three days at home, full-time at home, uh, we're not telling you you have to. We have a desk for you at the office. We have a workspace for you here at the office, but we're giving this to you as a benefit uh, that if you if this will help you, if you prefer this, you're allowed you're allowed to work part or full time at home. Um, I'm not going to be saying to my employer client that you should feel that you also have to fund that employee choice. So um, I wouldn't be recommending that to employer clients in the, in the general course for sure. Well, we've received some questions from the audience, which I want to turn to now. Um, the first being that, uh, let's say there's a scenario where an employee has been dismissed for failing to comply with an employer's mandatory vaccination policy. What impact would the mandatory vaccination policies of other employers, so not the employer that they were dismissed from, but other new potential employers have on the dismissed employee's duty to mitigate, Sarah? Um, so I think as Chris had mentioned earlier, it's going to depend on what area that you are working in. So for example, if you were looking working um, as a support worker in the long-term care industry, for example, um, and you hadn't been vaccinated, then, you know, I don't think a court's going to necessarily say or, or grant um, a longer notice period because 
in unless there were human rights considerations because it's an individual's personal choice not to get vaccinated. So I don't think there's a hard and fast rule in, in terms of that. Um, having said that, as an employer, um, you employers generally have the onus of, of establishing that an individual has failed to um, take all reasonable steps to mitigate. Having said that, uh, reasonable steps, in my experience as employer counsel, and I say this tongue in cheek, um, the bar is relatively low. So reasonable steps is not perfect steps. Um, so I think I would focus more on the industry or, or, or when advising a client, um, be realistic in terms of whether this is going to be uh, uh, an area in which we can argue for a you know shorter notice period, um, but uh, I, as Chris had mentioned, a large part of the cases of his have been to date summary judgment motions, so there hasn't been uh, a full analysis or or evidence led in terms of um, mitigation. So I'm I'll be interested to see when a decision comes out that fully canvasses the issue, and more importantly, what evidence the court looked at to either establish a failure to mitigate in light of this pandemic and how the policies intertwined or that someone uh, had uh, sufficiently attempted to mitigate their alleged damages. Yeah, I, I haven't seen a case that dealt with no. the, the issue you just described. It's, it's kind of interesting, right? You're saying I, I can't mitigate because I can't comply with your vaccination policy out of my own choice. So therefore I can't find a job. I think I think you might have certain judges on the bench uh, smirking at that and not not accepting that kind of logic, you know. And uh, as of as of yesterday at six p.m., there was no case. <laughs> so <there might> be, <laughs> between six p.m. and now, I can't comment. But as of six p.m. last night, right. there was no case. Yeah. yeah, generally, I think you made the right the right words there, Sarah. It's like generally, if you didn't get the job out of personal choice, that's not going to alleviate somebody from their failure to their duty to mitigate, right? So I think that's, that's the crux of the issue would be my, my view of it. I would think so. But what Sarah Crossley thinks and what judges <laughs> award are very two different things. Yeah. Uh, another audience member has asked about the other side of the coin. So can an employer refuse to offer employment to someone because the individual is unwilling to get a COVID-19 vaccine and doesn't have a valid exemption? So what, what are your thoughts on that? I'll jump in no. on that one. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think realistically, when you, you can ask whatever you want right, when you're hiring someone, so long as it's not prohibited by law. And taking your assumptions that there is no issue in terms of any ground of discrimination or anything to that effect, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to have a pre-employment condition requiring uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccination or proof thereof in order to be hired. Of course, you have to keep into account the, human, the requirements of the Human Rights Code but the Ontario Human Rights Commission has been uh, fairly clear that personal preferences and singular beliefs are not protected uh, under the Human Rights Code. Now, that said, I have yet to see a decision on this point. And what the Ontario Human Rights Commission says isn't necessarily legally binding. So um, that, you know, these may be left for another day. Um, but generally, I think you could do that if you have any doubt as to whether there is a legitimate reason for an employee to um, take the position that they shouldn't be required to do so. You can always seek some legal advice and figure out whether they have a legitimate reason. Go through an accommodation inquiry and find out. Right. We've, we've been doing that for employers over the course of the pandemic, and I'm, I'm sure you both have as well, Sarah and Giovanna, uh, Giovanna is saying. Uh, we're offering conditional uh, a conditional offer of employment subject to you showing proof of vaccination and then including in that offer is uh, is a potential exemption to that under the under the human for human rights related reasons right so that's that's out there I, i've seen lots of offers that we've drafted and lots that uh, lots of people have drafted that are putting that as a condition of an offer of employment that's the that's the way i've seen it done primarily and that's a pretty good way to be defensive, right? If going forward, if you make sure that your new employees comply with that pre-employment condition, you may no longer, you know, part of this debate may become moot over time. 
Mm -hmm. um, a number of our attendees have been raising the question about uh, compelling a return to office or a return to on-site work. So let's say there's a scenario where remote work poses no extra costs to the employer or doesn't raise any significant impediments to job performance or any other kind of practical issues. Can an employer compel an employee to return to work in the office when they've been working uh, from home without issue for the past few years? What do you think, Giovanna? Well, I mean, there are really two questions. One question is, can you? And the other question is, should you? Um, and so and that, and that may, de may really depend on the, the can you might be probably you could probably do it uh, subject to one uh, taking care of concerns with respect to accommodation. So we go back to the human rights consideration and two um, also potential. And I haven't seen this yet, but there is a potential for co a constructive dismissal claim if someone has been allowed to work remotely for maybe two years including outside of periods of time where individuals were mandated to work from home and, and say maybe they've moved away from their original location and they're now 200 kilometers from the office. Um, there, there may be a concern there, right? So can you, you, you probably can in most cases that are not, uh, that are not um, falling into the human rights bucket or into the I've moved 200 kilometers away from your workplace bucket. Uh, but do you want to do that? And I think that depends on the nature of your workplace, the nature of your workforce, um, and also whether you're struggling to recruit and maintain your employees, which is a real concern for a number of clients right now. I also think um, in terms of that's what, going back to Giovanni, that's why I was like, hopefully you use the word temporary <laughs> repeatedly throughout or remind people, uh, you know, after every six months or a year saying like, just yes, we're going to continue notwithstanding the decrease, but this please understand it's temporary. Um, but the other thing is, is that I think sometimes, um, and I agree with everything Giovanna said, but uh, an individual employee or even an individual team is only one aspect of an organization. And while they may individually think, right, everything is as good as can be in terms of, you know, working from home and there's been no change and I've been able to do my job. What if, and I'm not, I don't have stats or anything like this, but what if that particular team or that particular division of the company or that particular site, all of a sudden performance or, or you know, other KPI metrics have decreased um, and can be measured and or attributed to the work from home. I'm not saying it's necessarily a, a, a mandatory compelling everyone return to work, you know, on Monday sort of thing, right? Like, I think it's a way of um, educating your workforce and being mindful uh, and respectful in terms of, right, just because a whole bunch of things are come out from the government saying that we're now going to change things, right? Not turn around and say, okay, on Monday, everyone come back to work full time infinitum. And so I think uh, you're less likely to get a claim uh, as an employer vis-a-vis -vis constructive dismissal or, or any sort of um, claim arising out of uh, an unhappy or dis, uh, disgruntled uh, employee or employment situation is trying to educate the employees why you've made decisions that you're doing and provide some rationale, um, right? Like share statistics or share explanations um, and, and try and work towards buy-in. Uh, so there's a give and take in the relationship and, and the parties can work together towards a common goal. And also if you haven't done so already before you quote unquote force a return to work, um, you may have wanted to think about having a working from home policy because one of the aims of a work from home policy is to set out the boundaries about when you can work from home and when you're actually required to go to the office. And um, I would have hoped to see more requests from employers for work from home policies to prepare for return to work, but I really haven't seen as many as I thought I would. So if, you know, if folks are concerned about whether uh, individuals should continue to work from home, um, couple of days a week all the time or none at all. In all of those cases, I think it would be helpful to have a work from home policy that sets out what the boundaries are um, before people are forced to do something that they might perceive to be a unilateral fundamental change to the terms and conditions of their employment. And then we're going to get an influx of requests now. <laughs> Sorry, Chris, go ahead. 
Yeah, that, that, and that work from, from home policy in a perfect world also always keeps uh, the option for the employer to change their mind, right? To say, we have the right to decide that work from home doesn't work for us any longer and we can have you back. Um, I, and I think, I think everything that, um, that, that, especially what you were just talking about, Sarah, is right. And you want to you provide employees with reasons. But I think at the end of the day, it's important to understand as well that as long as the employer has done what everyone's talked about here is to said that the, that the work from home policy that we put in place is temporary and it's going to come to, to an end when the health and safety situation allows us to bring people back to work. Um, an employer is entitled to say to people, I, I want a workplace where people are in the office, right? And, and the employer at legally at the end of the day doesn't have to be right about that. They don't have to, they don't have to prove that, that people are more productive or that there's a reason why they have to do that from a legal perspective, from a, from a practical perspective, they might want to do that. They might want to be able to, to try to convince people why it's a good idea, but legally an employer can just say, that's the way I want it. So, so you're going to come back to work. Right at the at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we, the employer doesn't have to legally justify that decision. They don't have to be right. I guess is the point I'm making. So. Mm -hmm. The standard is not correctness, <laughs> as we say. No. The, the employer is entitled to be wrong about that. The employer is entitled mm -hmm. to say, "I think this workplace works better when people are here," uh, and they don't have to be right about that. An employer can make that decision and be wrong about it, and a judge isn't going to say, uh, "Well, prove it, employer." people weren't as productive at home. That's, that's not the test. An employer is entitled to set rules and they can be wrong about those rules as long as they've, they've made sure they didn't create a situation and create constructive dismissal issues because they didn't tell people this would be time limited, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get through a couple more of uh, the audience questions in the time that we have left. There's an interesting one that's been raised a couple of times about what happens if an employer mandates COVID-19 vaccination and an employee then suffers a vaccine injury or vaccine related illness. Would the employer be liable? What types of claims could the employee bring against the employer in that situation? If I'm understanding that correctly, you're saying the employee has contracted COVID-19 in the workplace? Is that, is that the question? The way the question is worded is vaccine injury. So I'm assuming some type of negative health symptom as a result of vaccination, not necessarily COVID-19 contraction itself. Oh, okay. Because they because they they got the, a shot and they had an adverse reaction to the shot is the, is the mm -hmm. question. Exactly. Right. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering if that would actually be a WSIB claim if you got the shot because your employer mandated you to get the shot. I'm not sure the employee would have a civil action. I think they might have to claim through WSIB if their position is the only reason I got the shot is because my employer mandated it. What, what do you guys think? Javon, I see your hand. Uh, yes. So uh, there are two aspects here. One of them is the claim against the employer, and then there could be a civil claim against manufacturer, right? So from the employer perspective, I agree with Chris. Um, I mean, obviously I have not seen any decisions on this yet. So we'll see what the tribunal might decide down the road. But in terms of uh, injury that may be related to a vaccine and claims against a manufacturer, the federal government has put together a vaccine injury support program that allows individuals who have um, suffered injuries relating to a vaccine to put in claims. And um, obviously there are gonna be conditions attached to that because that's a no fault scheme, much like you would find in a provincial sphere uh, where you're dealing with workplace injuries. Um, so query uh, whether in the presence of that scheme, you may actually have a claim or you may really have to submit a claim through the vaccine injury support program. That's an interesting point. Um, a similar question has been raised by a couple of our attendees, but in respect of COVID-19 transmission. So let's say the employees are now returned on site and someone catches COVID-19 from workplace exposure, uh, despite the employer having implemented safety protocols or other measures to try to mitigate against any risk of transmission. Um, have we seen 
claims of this sort, what types of liability would the employer face? Maybe I can just address that quickly as well. Um, so that at least in Ontario, the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, the WSIB has provided some guidance on this. Um, claims may be submitted to the WSIB, but it's going to be somewhat difficult to get them covered. And what the WSIB has indicated is that for a COVID-19 claim to be allowed, the claimant would have to show evidence that the person's risk of contracting the disease through their employment is greater than the risk to which the public at large is exposed and that work significantly contributed to the person's illness. I, again, do not know what is going to happen in the future, but if you have a workplace where you have policies and procedures in place to attempt to limit the transmission of COVID-19 in a context where public restrictions are being lifted, um, it is likely gonna be more and more difficult to be able to make out that kind of claim. Not impossible, but likely more difficult. Yeah, and, and, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, just, just my experience with that, most of those claims I've seen successfully brought against employers are in the context of a clear kind of outbreak that happened in the workplace, right? I think if, a, if an employee goes to WSIB and can establish that, that a bunch of people in the workplace all contracted COVID-19, I think they're going to be in generally in a pretty good position to get WSIB on side that they likely contracted it in the workplace based on what I've been seeing. Um, but I agree with you. I think that that as there's less and less of those types of things happening, uh, there's going to become a, a problem of, about proving that you contracted COVID in the course of your employment. I think also from the Occupational Health and Safety Act perspective, I think it's also going to go back to while these mandates may um, be being lifted, it's still important to remember an employer's obligation under the Occupational Health and Safety Act and make sure that you still, you know, make the appropriate efforts um, to maintain a safe work environment uh, because depending as things are lifted, if you know, we have a resurrection or here it comes again, right? You, you can, you know, for lack of a better word, argue a due diligence defense. Look, this happened despite the fact we tick the following steps. While these mandates were not lifted, we, we still, you know, whether it's our health and safety representative or joint health and safety committee regularly address or speak to or consider what possible um, hazards are in the workplace. And that continues to be possibly COVID-19 on a go forward basis. Mm -hmm. Does a business run the risk of discrimination, I'm assuming on the basis of disability in the context of this question, uh, run the risk of discrimination against people with compromised immune systems if they don't have protective policies in place to guard against COVID-19 transmission? Tufana, maybe, I don't know if you want to take that one. Sure, I don't actually have an answer to that question. Um, we'll find that that's a reality. We'll find out. Um, I don't. I mean, usually uh, the requirements under the Human Rights Code is not to implement, is not to implement a rule that is going to have an adverse impact on a group or an individual on the basis of a prohibited ground. The test isn't that you have to implement a rule. So. That might be an interesting piece of litigation one day when it ends up at the Human Rights Tribunal because the tribunal will have to grapple with whether or not it's normal test for discrimination requires the employer to take a positive step to implement an employer-wide policy not to potentially impact an immunocompromised individual. I think the more likely outcome here is going to be that if someone has a serious concern from a disability perspective and they require accommodation, it may be very well be the case that instead of having the employee being required to implement a policy, which is really an occupational health and safety concern, that the individual may have, may, depending on the circumstances, have a right to a reasonable accommodation, which is accommodation to the point of undue hardship. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. That's the context that would arise, right? Somebody would, would raise the fact that they need accommodation. And then if the employer doesn't address that, 
uh, through some policy or some proactive measures, then you have a, then you have a discrimination situation. I think that's right. And I suspect the employer would say, "Look, that is your preferred accommodation, but there may be other types of accommodation we can provide, and these are the other types of accommodation that would still keep you safe." For example, working from home. Um, <coughs> So, um, so the, em the employee would, would have a bit of a difficult time there because they would have to prove that the only reasonable accommodation that would fulfill, that would allow them to continue to, to work would be implementing a particular type of policy. That's, uh, that's a tough hill to climb. Mm -hmm. um, taking us back to the start of the hour when Sarah listed a bunch of the different public health measures that are going to be eased up over the next few weeks. If an employer drops its COVID-19 uh, monitoring or screening protocols for clients or employees based on these government announcements, would this be considered as putting the health and safety of employees at risk and lead to any potential liability under the human or not the human rights code, sorry, the occupational health and safety laws of their jurisdiction? What are your thoughts? I think it could, depending on the particular working environment. I mean, if the, the test is you need to take all reasonable precautions in the circumstances and what's reasonable in a particular circumstance will depend on that particular workplace. So um, there's, there certainly is the potential for, for liability if someone determines that it was remained reasonable for you to have those, those screening uh, tools in place. I, I haven't seen uh, a ton of charges under, under occupational health and safety for these types of things, but presumably they could happen. Well, no, and then the recently they've been saying that they've been calling for, you know, sort of passive testing or, or passive screening um, without yeah. defining what passive screening is. Um, maybe I'm too cautious, but again, it's only been 24 hours or 36 um, since these announcements and timeframes are lifting. What I've been telling my clients, again, it's an assumption of risk and it's, it's going to be, I th I've said you have to be more careful uh, the more your organization deals with vulnerable people. Uh, but I've said, you know, there's a difference between removing all screening requirements uh, and going down to sort of like a three question screening as opposed to a if yes, then no, if yes, like all these other things. I don't have the answer before someone asked the box, what would be those three questions? That's just me thinking off the top of my head and, 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 um, and you know, uh, troubleshooting with clients today. Uh, but I think I would, I'm counseling against removing screening in, in its entirety uh, and counseling moving towards a more, um, a shorter uh, a screening document or email or something like that, just at least in the interim until there's more guidance uh, provided or to be quite frank, um, given that all these things seem to be lifted when everyone returns from March break and people might be traveling, uh, I'm not convinced there may not be an uptick, you know, uh, in short order and so for the few weeks following that uh i maybe i'm more conservative but i i rather you know not rip off the band-aid entirely right away yeah. javon i see you have your hand up my one minute pitch check your local public health guidance your local public health units have been doing an incredible amount of work publishing guidelines and support documentation for employers and businesses throughout the pandemic they are in the process of now updating that information as the government measures change. I would recommend that you keep an eye on those over the next few months as well, because as the situation evolves, your public health unit is going to provide you with information that is timely and that is relevant to your local environment. Thank you, Giovanna, for that last minute comment. Um, so at this point, it's four o'clock and I wanna thank everyone who joined us for today's webinar. I hope you found the session to be as eye-opening and informative as I did. If we were unable to get to your question during the hour, I recognize that there were a lot of people who submitted different questions. I do apologize and I encourage you to reach out to any one of our esteemed panelists or to consult LexisNexis's resources for any guidance that you might need. Uh, this is definitely an ongoing and complicated issue. Uh, so hopefully we can all put our heads together and work through some of the problems that are gonna be sure to come up. Don't forget that you can claim this webinar for one hour of continuing professional development credit with your law society. And thanks again. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.